let's turn now to the challenge of the treatment of uh, <clears throat> relapse and refractory ALL. And Anthony, uh, give us your perspective on you know, what the goals of therapy are in the relapsed refractory setting, what, how you approach the patient in terms of trying to deal with that situation. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, I mean, the goals of treating a relapsed refractory patient, one, it depends on, again, the age of the patient. But, I mean, the, gen the general goal is to try and get the patient uh, into remission or MRD negative state and then proceed to a, tra to a transplant as that's the only current curative therapy for these patients. How often do you consider a second aloe? So for uh, City of Hope, for, to consider doing a second transplant, the patients uh, have to be more than six months following their first transplant. They have to have uh, preferably be in remission or just have very minimal disease present, and they have to fill all, fulfill all the organ criteria to be able to go through a transplant. And by doing that, our transplant-related mortality, doing a second transplant, has not uh, maybe a little bit higher than the first transplant, but it's but it's uh, generally manageable. Yeah, my opinion is that second transplants, particularly within the first year, should hopefully be on a protocol. Um, I send my patients like that to Anthony because they have the total marrow lymphoid irradiation uh, clinical trial that uh, looks to be very compelling in terms of disease control um, because those patients do have an exceptionally high risk of relapse after a second allo, but they also have increased risks of toxicity such as VOD and the treatment related mortality really goes up in that. Well, yeah, I mean the reason I ask is for those very high risk subsets, we have a, a, a gaping hole. We, we transplant them and we know they're still at very high risk of relapse most of our current protocols won't, won't allow those patients to come on. So if it's CAR-T, if they're still receiving their immunosuppressive medications, if there's any ongoing GVH, this is a big exclusion. And this is a problem, again, across multiple protocols. Yeah. So I think there are some clinical trials now that are maybe looking at, uh, for very high-risk patients, consider, uh, considering giving blenitumumab as maintenance therapy following a transplant to see if that will prevent relapse. I don't, uh, yeah. I've, I've certainly tried giving it to patients who are still receiving their TAC and their RAPA, which is what we use as our GVH Profi, without much success. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you have to taper first. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, blenitumumab is, is, is technically inert without T cells. Exactly. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a protein. It's not going to kill cells directly. You need to have the T cell activity. So if they're on a calcineurin inhibitor or other uh, T cell active immune suppressants, high dose steroids, then it's just not going to work. And I think uh, uh, in terms of post-transplant maintenance, I think as is often the case in any maintenance therapy and hematologic malignancies, one must ask, is it better to use it as maintenance or as rescue or salvage therapy at the time of relapse? So, you know, we know in large cell lymphoma, for example, if you get, you know, rituximab maintenance really doesn't improve outcomes. If you're giving rituximab as the, you know, as part of your frontline therapy, um, there's a lot of people that don't necessarily believe in rituximab maintenance mm -hmm. in other circumstances where we do actually have data to say it improves progression-free survival. When you're talking about blinitumumab where it's not trivial to give and it's mm -hmm. fairly expensive, um, it's a challenging topic. Certainly an important study question that needs to be addressed and it's, it's a good thing that that study is ongoing but it's not something I would do as part of routine practice no. even in someone that I thought was at very high risk of relapse. We bring up good points because we do need to think about the patients that relapse without having had a transplant and certainly those that do relapse after a transplant because unfortunately that's still a familiar scenario. Ryan, what's your approach to how you would treat a patient? Let's say they haven't had a transplant and they're, you're treating them for their pH positive ALL and uh, either they haven't, you felt they, they're not a candidate for a transplant or they, you haven't got there yet and now they've relapsed. Sure. So the, the first thing I do at the time, and we brought this up before, is if, if a patient with pH positive ALL has relapsed, uh, assuming that they got a TKI as part of their initial therapy, which I certainly hope would be the case, um, I would at that point do able kinase domain mutation testing to see if there was a, a mutation that may have predicted a failure of whatever TKI they were on before. And then if a mutation is present, taking the experience from the CML literature, using that to sort of guide the choices. Um, if it was a patient who had imatinib frontline, but there's no mutation, I might try desatinib. Mm -hmm. If it was desatinib that they got first line and they relapsed and there's no mutation, I might try nilotinib. Mm 
but of course if they have a T315I mutation, that pretty much limits us to panotinib. Um, if it's a patient that is relatively young and fit and I'm gonna try to get them to transplant and try to get the deepest remission possible, I'll usually not rely solely on a TKI in that setting. I'll usually combine it with some form of chemotherapy. There's not a whole lot of data that supports that, but it's certainly a reasonable extrapolation to know, well, we can give it, we can give these drugs safely with hyper for example. Uh, in the frontline setting, we could certainly do it in the relapse setting.